Complete Life of William McKinley by Marshall Everett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of President William McKinley Chapter 1 The Assassination of President McKinley on Friday, September 6, 1901, the blackest Friday in American history, the American people were shocked and stunned by the news that their beloved President, William McKinley, had been shot down by a cowardly assassin while attending the Pan-American Exposition at Buffalo. It was like a flash of lightning from a clear sky. The people were stunned into momentary silence. The sign of grief was on the face of every loyal American, and the hearts of the people beat as one in sympathy for the stricken chief. The horror of the tragic event grew when it was learned that the assassin was an anarchist, and not an insane man, as was first supposed. Then came the full realization that the murderous bullet of the assassin was aimed not only at the foremost citizen of the Republic, but that the red thing called anarchy had raised its blood-stained hand against government, against all peaceable authority and law. It was a blow struck at all the institutions of society that men hold dear and sacred. With that wonderful self-control that distinguishes the American people, loyal citizens restrained the rising passion in their breasts, and their suppressed rage was further held in check by the word of hope which followed that the president was yet alive. Alas, it was but a hope, destined to linger but a few days. The scene of the assassination was the Temple of Music, at the exposition grounds. The day previous was President's Day at the exposition, and President McKinley had delivered what many believed to be the greatest speech of his life. Praises for his wisdom and statesmanship were ringing around the world. On the fateful day the President attended the exposition as a visitor, and in the afternoon held a reception in the Temple of Music. The reception to the President was one to which the general public had been invited. President John G. Milburn of the exposition had introduced the President to the great crowd in the temple, and men, women, and children came forward for a personal greeting. Among those in line was Leon Scholdos, whose right hand was wrapped in a handkerchief. Folded in the handkerchief was a thirty-two caliber self-acting revolver holding five bullets. A little girl was led up by her father, and the President shook hands with her. As she passed along to the right, the President looked after her smilingly, and waved his hand in pleasant adieu. Next in line came a boyish-featured man about twenty-six years old, preceded by a short Italian who leaned backwards against the bandaged hand of his follower. The officers who attended the President noted this man their attention being first attracted by the Italian, whose dark shaggy brows and black mustache caused the professional protectors to regard him with suspicion. The man with the bandaged hand and innocent face received no attention from the detectives beyond the mental observation that his right hand was apparently injured, and that he would present his left hand to the President. The Italian stood before the palm bower. He held the President's right hand so long that the officers stepped forward to break the clasp and make room for the man with the bandaged hand, who extended the left hand toward the President's right. The Fatal Shots The President smiled and presented his right hand in a position to meet the left of the approaching man. Hardly a foot of space intervened between the bodies of the two men. Before their hands met, two pistol shots rang out, and the President turned slightly to the left and reeled. The bandage on the hand of the tall, innocent-looking young man had concealed a revolver, 
he had fired through the bandage without removing any portion of the handkerchief. The first bullet entered too high for the purpose of the assassin, who had fired again as soon as his finger could move the trigger. On receiving the first shot, President McKinley lifted himself on his toes with something of a gasp. His movement caused the second shot to enter just below the navel. With the second shot, the President doubled slightly forward and then sank back. Secret Service Detective Geary caught the President in his arms, and President Milburn helped to support him, asks if he is shot. When the President fell into the arms of Detective Geary, he coolly asked, Am I shot? Geary unbuttoned the President's vest, and seeing blood, replied, I fear you are, Mr. President. It had all happened in an instant. Almost before the noise of the second shot sounded, a Negro waiter, James F. Parker, leaped upon the assassin, striking him a terrific blow and crushing him to the floor. Soldiers of the United States artillery, detailed at the reception, sprang upon them, and he was surrounded by a squad of exposition police and Secret Service detectives. Detective Gallagher seized Sholgoz's hand, tore away the handkerchief, and took the revolver. The artillerymen, seeing the revolver in Gallagher's hand, rushed at the assassin and handled him rather roughly. Meanwhile, Detective Ireland and the Negro held the assassin, endeavoring to shield him from the attacks of the infuriated artillerymen and the blows of policemen's clubs. Supported by Detective Geary and President of the Exposition Milburn, and surrounded by Secretary George B. Cordelieu and half a dozen exposition officials, the President was assisted to a chair. His face was white, but he made no outcry. When the second shot struck the President, he sank back with one hand holding his abdomen, the other fumbling at his breast. His eyes were open, and he was clearly conscious of all that had transpired. He looked up into President Milburn's face and gasped, Cortelieu, the name of his private secretary. The President's secretary bent over him. Cortelieu, said the President, my wife, be careful about her. Don't let her know. Moved by a paroxysm, he writhed to the left, and his eyes fell upon the prostrate form of the assassin, Sholgos, lying on the floor bloody and helpless beneath the blows of the guard. The president raised his right hand, red with his own blood, and placed it on the shoulder of his secretary. Let no one hurt him, he gasped, and sank back in the chair, while the guards carried Sholgos out of his sight. The ambulance from the exposition hospital was summoned immediately, and the president, still conscious, sank upon the stretcher. Secretary Cortelieu and Mr. Milburn rode with him in the ambulance, and in nine minutes after the shooting, the President was awaiting the arrival of surgeons, who had been summoned from all sections of the city, and by special train from Niagara Falls. The President continued conscious, and conversed with Mr. Cortelieu and Mr. Milburn on his way to the hospital. I am sorry, he said, to have been the cause of trouble to the exposition. Three thoughts had found expression with the president. First, that the news should be kept from his wife. Second, that the would-be assassin should not be harmed. And third, regret that the tragedy might have hurt the exposition. The news that the president had been shot passed across the exposition grounds with almost incredible speed, and the crowd around the temple grew until it counted 50,000 persons. This big crowd followed the ambulance respectfully to the hospital, the other eager to find the assassin and punish him. Certain it is that if officials had not used remarkable diligence in taking Sholgos out of the way of the crowd, he would have been mobbed and beaten to death. Sholgos had been carried into a side room at the northwest corner of the temple. There he was searched, but nothing was found upon him except a letter related to lodging. The officers washed the blood from his face and asked him who he was and why he had tried to kill the president. 
He made no answer at first, but finally gave the name of Neiman. He offered no explanation of the deed except that he was an anarchist and had done his duty. A detail of exposition guards was sent for a company of soldiers. A carriage was summoned. South of the temple a space had been roped off. The crowd tore out the iron stanchion holding the ropes and carried the ropes to a flagpole standing nearby on the esplanade. Lynch him, cried a hundred voices, and a start was made for one of the entrances to the temple. Soldiers and police beat back the crowd. Guards and pe people were wrangling, shouting, and fighting. In this confusion, Sholgo, still bleeding, his clothes torn, and scarcely able to walk, was led out by Captain James F. Bilali, chief of the expedition detectives, Commandant Robinson, and a squad of secret servicemen. Sholgos was thrown into a carriage, and three detectives jumped in with him. Captain Vallali jumped on the driver's seat and lashed the horses into a gallop. Six doctors were at the president's side within thirty seconds after his arrival at the hospital, among them the president's family physician, Dr. P. M. Rixey. Dr. Roswell Park, a surgeon of national reputation, was summoned from Niagara Falls, where he was performing an operation, and Dr. Herman Minter arrived soon after. The surgeons consulted and hesitated about performing an operation. The president reassured them by expressing his confidence, but no decision was reached when Dr. Mann of the Exposition Hospital staff arrived. After another consultation, Dr. Mann informed the president that an operation was necessary. All right, replied the president. Go ahead. Do whatever is proper. The anesthetic administered was ether, and for two and a half hours the president was under the influence of this. The wound in the breast proved to be only a flesh wound. The bullet struck a button and was somewhat deflected. It entered the middle of the breast above the breastbone, but did not penetrate far. When the president was undressed for the operation, the bullet fell from his clothing upon the table. The second and serious wound was a bullet hole in the abdomen, about five inches below the left nipple, and about an inch and a half to the left of the median line. The bullet which caused the wound penetrated both the interior and posterior walls of the stomach, going completely through that organ. It was also found, as a consequence of the perforation of the stomach fluid, had circulated about the abdominal cavity. Further examination disclosed that the hole made by the entrance of the bullet was small and clean cut, while that on the other side of the stomach was large and ragged. A five-inch incision was made, and through that aperture the physicians were enabled to turn the organ about so as to suture the larger bullet hole. After that had been sewed, the abdominal cavity was washed with a salt solution. The operation performed on President McKinley at the emergency hospital left no need for a second operation to follow it almost immediately. Dr. Mann, who performed the operation, had for his assistant Dr. Herman Minter. His second assistant was Dr. John Parmenter. His third assistant was Dr. Lee of St. Louis, who happened to be on the exposition grounds at the time of the tragedy, and placed his services at the disposal of the president. Dr. Nelson W. Wilson noted the time of the operation and took notes. Dr. Eugene Wasden of the Marine Hospital gave the anesthetic. Dr. Rixey arrived at the latter part of the operation and held the light. Dr. Park arrived at the close of the operation. It was Dr. Mann who wielded the knife. The operation lasted almost an hour. A cut about five inches long was made. It was found necessary to turn up the stomach of the president in order to trace the course of the bullet. The bullet's opening in the front wall of the stomach went was small, and it was carefully closed with sutures, after which a search was made for the hole in the back wall of the stomach. This hole, where the bullet went out of the stomach, was larger than the hole in the front wall of the stomach. In fact, it was a wound over an inch in diameter, jagged and ragged. It was sewed up in three layers. 
This wound was larger than the wound where the bullet entered the stomach because the bullet, in its course, forced tissues through ahead of it. In turning up the stomach, an act that was absolutely necessary and was performed by Dr. Mann with rare skill, the danger was that some of the contents of the stomach might go into the abdominal cavity and as a result cause peritonitis. It so happened that there was little in the president's stomach at the time of the operation. Moreover, subsequent developments tended to show that this feature of the operation was successful and that none of the contents of the stomach entered the abdominal cavity. If any of the contents had entered the cavity, the probability is that peritonitis would have set in. The weapon used by the assassin proved to be a five-barrel double-action revolver of thirty-two caliber. Every chamber contained a bullet, and three remained in the weapon after the shooting. It was at first reported that the weapon was a derringer, but this proved to be incorrect. Many of the accounts of the assassination vary in detail, which is quite natural under the excitement of the moment and the fact that no two persons see and hear alike. One account, given by an eyewitness, which differs in some respects from the one with which this chapter begins, is as follows. It was about four o'clock, near the close of the reception in the Temple of Music, and the President, in his customary cordial manner, was reaching forward with a pleasant smile to take the hands of the good-natured crowd that was pushing forward. A six-foot colored man, who proved to be a waiter in the plaza, named James F. Parker, had just shaken hands with the President and was smiling all over with enjoyment, when suddenly behind him pressed forward the slight figure of a smooth-faced but muscular young man, whose eyes were wild and glaring, whose head was drooping, and who seemed to me to have sprung up from the floor, as I had not observed him before. The President took no special notice of him, but simply stooped over to shake his hand without looking, apparently, at the individual. Their palms hardly touched before I heard two shots in quick succession. A hush and quiet instantly followed. The President straightened up for a moment and stepped back five or six feet. Secretary Cortelyou, who had been standing at his side, burst into tears and exclaimed, "'You're shot!' The president murmured, Oh, no, it cannot be, but Secretary Cortelyou and Mr. Milburn had torn open the president's vest, and the telltale blood flowing from the wound in the abdomen revealed the fearful truth. The president had dropped into a chair and now turned deathly pale. Meanwhile, the other wound in the breast had been uncovered, and both Mr. Milburn and Secretary Cortelyou were in tears. The president, seeing their emotion, put up his hand and gently murmured that he was all right, or some reassuring words, and appeared to faint away. The Secret Service men, Foster and Ireland, at once bound and seized the assassin before the smoke had cleared away, and in fact before the sound of the second shot was heard. The Negro, Parker, also turned instantly and confronted Shulgos, whose right hand was being tightly held behind him by the detectives and whose face was thrust forward. Parker, with his clenched fist, smashed the assassin three times squarely in the face, and was apparently wild to kill the creature while all the crowd of artillerymen, policemen, and others also sat upon the object of their wrath. The women in the vast audience were hysterical, and the men were little less than crazy. The transformation from the scene of smiles and gladness of a moment before to the wild, rushing, mighty roar of an infuriated crowd was simply awful. The police and military at once set about the task of clearing the building, which they accomplished with amazing celerity and good judgment, considering the fact that a crowd of fifty thousand at the outside was pressing into the entrance. A third narrative is still somewhat different. The narrator recites that the president, after he had been shot, was calm, seemed to grow taller, and had a look of half-reproach and half-indignation in his eyes as he turned and started toward a chair unassisted. Then Secretary Cortelyou and Mr. Milburn went to his help. Secret Service Agent S. R. Ireland and George F. Foster had grappled with the assassin, 
but quicker than both was a gigantic negro james f parker a waiter in the restaurant in the plaza who had been standing behind shoulders awaiting an opportunity and joyous expectation to shake the president's hand he stood there six feet four inches tall with two hundred and fifty pounds of muscular enthusiasm grinning happily until he heard the pistol shots with one quick shift of his clenched fist he knocked the pistol from the assassin's hand with another he spun the man around like a top and with a third he broke sholgos's nose a fourth split the assassin's lip and, and knocked out several teeth and when the officers tore him away from parker the latter crying like a baby exclaimed oh for only ten seconds more End of chapter one of the complete life of william mckinley by marshall everett read by gerald hawkins santa clara california